Newfoundland and Iberia face each other across the North Atlantic. Both continental margins have seen offshore geophysical exploration and some deep sea drilling, which makes them important places for testing models of continental rifting and breakup. But best of all, they fit back together, forming a so-called pair of conjugate margins. So they should record the full history by which a once continuous intact continental block rifted apart to form a new ocean basin. It's a great test bed for rifting models. The area has a long history of tectonic study with geophysical studies of the Iberian margin, and these stretch back to the 1970s. These, along with early deep sea drilling campaigns, informed early ideas of the structure of rifted margins, and these were applied around the world through the 1980s. Here's a version of one of these pioneering interpretations. It shows the idea that the structure can be described as, as controlled by down to the ocean dipping listric normal faults that tap into the lower crust. Consequently, the crust thins over a fairly wide area and sediment is ponded in a series of half graben. Well, let's zoom out. And here's a profile based on wide angle seismic data, which betrays the crustal thickness coming off Iberia. Let's look to the other side of the Atlantic and at a scale. And this is based on another set of wide angle seismic experiments called Screech. And we can compare the Newfoundland margin with the Galicia part of North Iberia. Let's exaggerate the vertical scale a bit. So we can see that on the Newfoundland side, the crust is only weakly thinned. It's still, a, it's still got a respectable thickness and it necks very abruptly to thin to almost absent continental crust. In contrast, the Iberian side thins over a much greater region. So the margins are strongly asymmetric. It's tempting because the margins are asymmetric to go back to the asymmetric rifting model that is formalized by Brian Wernicke in the mid 1980s, which shows the idea that stretching of the continental lithosphere is on an inclined master detachment fault. This idea is applied to continental margins a year or two later by Lister and others. And if you take the asymmetric rifting model and run it to its conclusion so that you rip apart and create a new oceanic lithosphere, you end up with the structure shown below. You have the foot wall, the so-called lower plate margin, represented by a broad area of down to the ocean normal faults and an upper plate margin which represents the old hanging wall block to our left dipping extensional detachment which has a very abrupt form with crustal thickness maintained but necking very quickly down to the oceanic crust so an asymmetric pair of margins so going back to the Newfoundland-Iberia pair, various groups have taken the Lister et al. model and applied it to explain the asymmetry between Galicia on one side and Newfoundland on the other. Galicia would become a lower plate margin, Newfoundland an upper plate margin. And in between we expose the original subcontinental lithosphere and it's through this that we create the new oceanic lithosphere through seafloor spreading. And here's an interpretation based on the ideas of Jamretta Malachal for this process of hyperextension with a low angle detachment fault inclined from Iberia eventually going down beneath Newfoundland. The Galicia margin being a lower plate block, the foot wall to this detachment, Newfoundland being an upper plate block, the hanging wall to this detachment. On the Galicia margin, this model predicts that there's lots of upper crustal extension, but very little lower crustal extension. So there's an extension discrepancy between upper and lower crust that perhaps we might be able to investigate. So this was the aim of a study by Reston and McDermott. They wanted to explore the extension discrepancy on the Iberian margin. In doing this, they compared the crustal thickness 
with the stretching on faults which represents the stretching of the uppermost crust. The crustal thickness was estimated from a wind angle seismic experiment. The stretching on faults was based on an interpretation of a seismic reflection profile which imaged the top of the basement, the top of the crust. For the seismic reflection interpretation, slopes that dipped towards the ocean, leftwards in other words, were assumed to be fault scarps. So using these data and interpreting them, Reston and McDermott were able to plot crustal thinning versus stretching on faults. So on the graph, we have stretching factor on faults running up the vertical axis, stretching factor on crust on the lower axis. It's set up so that zero represents no stretching at all, one represents infinite stretching. And if the two stretching factors match, they should plot on that diagonal with a slope of one, the no extension mismatch line. So how was stretching on faults estimated? Through heave summation. So in other words, you recognize the horizontal component of displacement on all those little escarpments, assumed to be fault scarps, and together all those little blue bars, and it gives you the total heave. Look at, working out the crustal thinning is simply to measure the thickness of the crust at any given point on the profile and relate it back to an unstretched thickness of crust beneath mainland Iberia. So let's see how that holds up. Here's the relationship. And we can see there's much more crustal thinning than fault heave. The cross shape gives an idea of the uncertainty in these values. But it sits nowhere near the no extension mismatch line. There's clearly an extension mismatch. Now, interpreting faults on seismic reflection profiles always risks missing some faults because of the seismic resolution. And this is also recognized by Reston and McDermott, so they allow us some tolerance to the mismatch line. Here it is. So this is allowing for non-imaged faults. But even so, the data cross plot sits way away from this tolerance. So the next question they wanted to ask was, does this mismatch vary as you go down the margin? To do that, let's divide the margin up into three domains, A, B and C. Zone A is down towards the ocean, zone C back towards mainland Iberia, and B lies in between. And for those various crustal thicknesses, we can compare with the heaves on faults that lie in those zones. So how does this work when we plot it up? Does this mismatch vary down the margin? Well, yes, indeed it does. We can see that the greatest mismatch is in zone A, down towards the ocean. But even in zone C, back towards the continent, there's still a significant mismatch. So there's more crustal thinning than faulting, and this discrepancy increases in importance as you move away from the continent towards the ocean. But before accepting this conclusion, we have to ask a question. How good are we at recognizing heave? That lower diagram is an interpretation. It's not raw data. It relies on the assumption that those escarpments are the total heave on the fault. Now, this issue has been addressed in another study. These are some models by Julia Gomez Romeo and her co-workers. In doing this, they applied the Buck model for faulting and deformation, whereby faulting unloads the footwall, which rebounds isostatically. This footwall doming deforms the normal fault as well. The pattern of doming relates to the amount of fault movement together with the isostatic response of the lithosphere which is in turn governed by its strength, represented by the effective elastic thickness. So in the top diagram, the fault extension is five kilometers and the effective elastic thickness is two and a half kilometers. The lower diagram shows what happens if you have a higher fault extension and a lower rigidity, weaker lithosphere. But let's think about what that means about apparent heave if we think the heave just represents the fault scarp, in other words, the steeply dipping component 
of the normal fault just before it disappears below surface, the apparent heave is significantly less than the true horizontal offset on that fault. So interpretation of seismic reflection profiles risks seriously underestimating the true heave for large displacement normal faults. In order to make an appropriate interpretation of the seismic reflection profile, we have to be able to interpret the top of the basement as to whether it's the original pre-rift sedimentary cover, the green, or whether it represents exposed footwall to a fault represented to where that green material has been pulled away. And in practice, that can be really tricky. So the fault scarp need not represent the full fault geometry. Consequently, the extension discrepancy based on that type of interpretation may be more apparent than real. It's underestimating the true heave on these faults. So maybe there is no extension discrepancy and consequently the amount of crustal extension can match the amount of upper crustal extension. So this illustrates part of the problem of doing structural geology when the strain is high and being reliant entirely on seismic reflection profiles. An alternative then is to perhaps let's assume that there's no discrepancy and interpret the necessary structures and the structural evolution to achieve the geometries that are resolvable. So this takes us to another strategy. And this is numerical simulation. In this, we'll assume there's no discrepancy in stretching when considered across the entire margin pair. All crustal levels are conserved. However, we need not assume such conservation for the lithospheric mantle, because the distinction between the mantle in the lithosphere and the asthenosphere is rheological and therefore can change as the deformation progresses. This behaviour can be explored through a thermomechanical model. So for this, we'll assume a strength depth profile down through a layered lithosphere of upper crust, lower crust and the mantled component. So this approach was adopted by Saskia Bruno and others. And here are their results. So we're dealing with a rheological multilayer. Let's play it out through time. Eight million years, we can just see a sphere upwelling in the middle of the model. We can see the lower crust necking away as the upper crust thins on faults. After 16 million years, the asthenosphere has upwelled to very shallow levels. The crust has thinned a lot. But because the asthenosphere has upwelled, we now have hot mantle near surface and that will cool down. As a consequence, it will change rheology and become mechanical lithosphere. So this upper part of formerly upwelled asthenosphere is now mechanical lithosphere. Let's continue the deformation. And we expose on the seabed mantle rocks. We've got a strongly asymmetric system. On the left hand side we have a very narrow continental margin compared to that on the right. We've uplifted mantle to the surface. That surface is of course covered with seawater and can react with the upper mantle to create a layer of serpentinite which may allow deformation to become even more strongly localised along that zone. So the approach can be to take this model output and compare it with the geophysically imaged conjugate margin pair of Newfoundland Iberia. By changing the parameters, Brunner et al. were able to create multiple scenarios and then choose the best one to fit. These different parameters include changing the heat flow, changing the strength profile down through the lithosphere and changing the strain rate. So in this model, we have a high geothermal gradient, a weak lower crust and a relatively weak mantle lithosphere. In this scenario, we have a lower geothermal gradient, consequently a stronger lower crust and a strong mantle lithosphere. So these are two different scenarios because we have two different sets of parameters that were input to the model.
Consequently, the margin geometries are different in the two cases. Which of these fits the Newfoundland-Iberia pair the best? Well, it looks like the lower one and various parts of the simulation could be matched with parts of the real world. We have the asymmetric pair with the abrupt margin of Newfoundland and the broad margin of Galicia-Iberia. So these models are able to simulate the asymmetry and the difference patterns of crustal thinning and the presence of exhumed mantle on the seabed. And these features are consistent with models of asymmetric rifting developed by Manachal and others. So where have we got to? Well, in the decades since the original interpretations of the Iberia margin were developed, so rifted continental margins are now considered to be considerably more complicated structurally than originally envisaged after initial forays from the 1970s. The models of hyperextension developed in the decades following the 1970s rely on the idea of heterogeneous strain. Heterogeneous down through the lithosphere and across the lithosphere in different places. And so conjugate margins are commonly asymmetric. If we allow strain to be heterogeneous, there may be many different types of models rather than simply the one developed by Lister et al. that may work in reality through the variety of the world's rifted continental margins. So hyperextension involves heterogeneous strain through the lithosphere. Developing further understanding is challenging. The requirements of understanding heterogeneous strain require quantification of the structural geologies. These observations we use are inherently dependent on interpretation of sometimes rather marginal seismic images. A way forward, as we've seen, is to attempt to simulate rifting and breakup through numerical models. The challenge then is to test not only the assumptions of input parameters like lithosphere rheological structure, but also the outputs of crustal structure. So this remains very much a work in progress.